first, I want to open the meeting. I guess I'm going to give myself a shameless plug here. But Barbara and I will be at the Miami Book Fair Authors event this coming Saturday, a week from today. Uh, we'll be uh, exhibiting our Baseball Under the Palms and Baseball Under the Palms 2. Uh, it'll be held at the downtown Miami-Dade Library from 11 to 5. And uh, also, I'll be doing a short presentation on uh, Baseball Under the Palms 2. It lasts about seven minutes. But if anybody wants to come down and say hi, we'll both be there. Look forward to seeing you if you are. And we'll get right to the uh, good stuff of this meeting. Uh, I think tonight, in fact, I know tonight, we're going to get some new Yankee knowledge that we know, probably don't know, but that's good. We need to more Yankee knowledge and baseball knowledge. And um, I'll introduce Paul. Uh, Dr. Paul Semendinger is widely known for his deep knowledge of the history of baseball, specifically the New York Yankees, if you couldn't tell by the cap. <laughs> He's a member of the IBWAA, Internet Baseball Writers Association of America, and a regular contributor to their exclusive newsletter, Here's the Pitch. He operates as the uh, chief editor of an extremely successful Yankees blog, Start Spreading the News, which I'm sure some of the Yankee fans are aware of. And he is the guest host on several sports radio and podcasts. And Paul has a little note here, which I appreciate. It still pitches in the New Jersey Baseball League and holds out hopes that the Yankees will call him to pitch for a big club, for the big club. And so I turn the time over to Paul. Paul, it's all yours. Oh, thank you so much. Listen, it's a great, great, great honor and privilege. While uh, I was being introduced, I showed you why I kept my hat on. I don't have any hair left for the most part. So when I when <laughs> when I do these, it's much too bright on my on my forehead. So so I put the hat on. But yes, I'm a lifelong Yankee fan. I became a Yankee fan in 1977. Um, I'll tell that that my favorite story. I became a Yankee fan, and my parents were both school teachers. And my dad actually had back to school night during the last game, game six of the World Series. And I was watching it with my mom, watching Reggie hit those home runs. And my dad came home and I was only nine. So I had to go to bed. And my dad said, it's time for Paulie to go to sleep. And it was my mom who said, let's let Paulie stay up and watch the Yankees win the World Series. And so I saw Reggie and then hit his last home run and the Yankees win the World Series. And from that point on, the Yankees captured my heart. And I've been a Yankee fan uh, die hard ever since through good and bad, mostly good, obviously, when you're a Yankee fan. But but there there were some lean years there for a little while there. My dad, which is interesting, is a lifelong Red Sox fan, grew up loving the Boston Red Sox, became a fan in 1946. And he's still the biggest Ted Williams fan who's out there. So uh, he never told me I had to become a, a Red Sox fan and he allowed me to be a Yankee fan. And um I'd reached out to the, some Sabre chapters to come talk because I have a new book coming out in April. It's the autobiography of Roy White. Here's the photograph from the cover. Um, Roy White was a Yankee from 1965 to 1979, widely considered the greatest Yankees left fielder of all time, and a career that's been a lot of uh, forgotten by a lot of people. And through my connections with a podcast that, I, that I'm on through the Northeast Streaming Sports Network, um, I was able to get in touch with Roy White. And I pitched him the, the idea of me writing his autobiography with him. And I think what I did when I made this pitch to him is I gave him an offer that nobody else ever gave. You know, Roy White became a Yankee in the late 60s, mid 60s, 65. And so his career coincided with the last years of Mickey Mantle's career. And then he played with Thurman Munson for Thurman's whole career. But of course, that's also when George Steinbrenner buys the team. And then you have the great Yankee teams of the late seventies with all the controversy, the Bronx zoo teams that Sparky Lyle called them the Bronx zoo teams with Reggie and Thurman arguing and Billy Martin and, and all of that. And my sense is that most of the big time New York sports writers would have loved to work with Roy White but Roy White is too dignified to tell all of the dirty secrets that that people would want. And, and my sense was every time he was approached to do a book, they said, like, oh, let's get your version of all these tell all tales. And I don't think he ever wanted to do that. So I told him, I'll write your book with you if you'd like. But 
the book will be entirely what you want it to say. It'll be Roy White's story, not Roy White's story to sell out your teammates or your coaches or your managers or anybody else. It's Roy White's story about your baseball career and who you interacted with and how it went. And I think he liked the idea. And he lives a couple of towns away from me. So this all started around last Christmas, a year ago, 2021. And we spent most of 2022 meeting every couple of weeks. We had a secret location where we would meet in a town called Ramsey, New Jersey. That secret location was a place called Panera Bread. <laughs> and, and we would just meet there and, and, and I would ask him questions. I brought my laptop and uh, my keyboard. And we would just talk baseball and I would transcribe, you know, the, what, what he was talking about when he talked about his career. And then I'd send him the drafts of each chapter. And, um, you know, over the course of a year, we were able to write his entire book and it comes out in April. And, and I think it's going to be great because it's, it's a true story of Roy White and the people who've read it, the people who've done the previews and, and written reviews for it, um, have all said it's it's just a wonderful book because you feel like you're sitting down and talking with Roy White and having him share the story of his whole life. It's called From Compton to the Bronx. Roy White grew up in Compton, out you know part of Los Angeles, and he grew up in poverty. It would he did not have a, a, a plentiful childhood, and he was able then to play a lot of baseball in his childhood. And, you know, it's eventually, he actually grew up in a hotbed of baseball. There were a number, numbers of, of ball players who grew up with him, including Reggie Smith, who we played against in the world series. Doc Ellis grew up in that area. There were a whole bunch of guys, Jim Rooker, um, the Lefevre brothers uh, were, were from that area. And he was able to be a star as, as a kid playing on the uh, American Legion teams and the semi-pro teams and the high school teams. And he got a contract with the Yankees, which is a great story in and of itself. And the first time he was ever on an airplane was when he flew to Florida to go to spring training. Roy White um, was more of a light skin African-American. Uh, he actually grew up from a mixed family, his father and mother, um, his mother was black and his father was white. And um, maybe that led to a, a lesser of a, of a dark complexion. But when he first got to spring training, he grew up playing baseball in the segregated South. And one of the stories that was at the, in the, in the book that he shared was the Yankees maybe didn't realize he was an African-American and they put him up in the team hotel, which none of the other black players were allowed to be part of. And one of the guys asked him at spring training, they're like, we see you here every day practicing, but how come you're not staying where we are? Where are you staying? He's like, I'm staying over there at the, the team hotel. And they're like, you're not allowed to be there. It's segregated. And, uh, but he stayed there throughout that very first spring training. But then the rest of his career in the minor leagues, he faced all sorts of hostile segregation and, 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 and racism and things like that. And it was horrible experience, obviously. But Roy White, the thing that makes him so special is he was dignified and he's a classy guy. And when there was all that other chaos around those Yankees of the late 1970s, Roy White was never part of it. And so when I asked him about it, like, what was it like to face racism as you were trying to start your professional baseball career? He said it wasn't good. It was horrible. But in his modest, self-depreciating type of way, he also said, you know, others who came before me had it a lot worse. And and that was really a tone of, of how he approached everything. He He's just a humble, humble guy in spite of having a 15-year Major League Baseball career and playing on in three World Series and two World Championships. And then after his Yankee career, he went and played in Japan. He was a, a little bit of a trendsetter there. So he played three years with the Yamiori Giants, one of only two guys ever and the first ever to win a World Series in America with the Yankees and a Tokyo Series in Japan with the Giants, the Japanese version of the Yankees. The only other guy to ever do that also played left field, and that was Hideki Matsui, who came years later. So that's the book. The book's called From Compton to the Bronx. It's um, 
People are pre-ordering it now because it's available if you went to Amazon, but the book doesn't come out in print until April 11th. And so we're looking forward to that. And, you know, up here in the New Jersey, New York area, we're starting to set up all sorts of, you know, book book talks and looking to get into stadiums and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, as a fan, a kid growing up watching the Yankees and watching the Roy White Yankees, it's a dream come tr true to actually have the opportunity to sit with him and hear his life story and to write his life story with him and to um, hear about the players that I grew up idolizing. Uh, quick story. You see, you might see Greg Nettles right over my shoulder, right back here. That, that was my guy. My favorite player was Greg Nettles. Um, my sister, who's two years older than me, her favorite player was Roy White. And, you know, when you're nine years old, there's something about being nine years old. You can't have the same favorite player, I guess, as your older sister. So I couldn't be a Roy White fan as my favorite. I I, I gravitated to Nettles. But, um, yeah, obviously, Roy White's one of the great Yankees. And, and as the stories of his career, how he became great, how he rose through the minor leagues, how he overcame poverty and racism and segregation – and became an integral part of uh, the great Yankee teams of the 70s is, was just uh, a great deal of fun to listen to, a great deal of fun to relive with Roy White, and obviously a great deal of fun and a distinct honor to be able to write about it. Um, I'd also love to just share with you, if you haven't known, I wrote this other Yankee book called The Least Among Them. I'm not here to sell books, but that's the story of the 29 players whose entire career lasted of just one game as a Yankee. So that was also a fun book to write. But when I come to meetings like this, rather than me just talking, I could talk forever. I was a school principal. Uh, I was an educator for 32 years. I just retired last at the end of last summer. So I could talk forever, but I wouldn't want to bore anybody and have people just say, this guy doesn't ever stop talking. So what I'd love to do instead is I'd love to talk with you and, um, you could share your baseball memories with me and, and you could ask questions about Roy White or the Yankees or anything. And I just love to have a great conversation and, and uh, have a chance to meet you all as, as members of the South Florida Sabre group. Oh, thank you. Well, pa uh, Paul, I want to ask you something right away. I'm curious about the least among them. How did you go about uh, interviewing the players and finding the players? Uh, what, what, what method did you use? Well, how did you do that? <laughs> All right. So, so that book is the exact opposite of the Roy White book. I didn't talk to any of the players. <laughs> it's, it's strictly a history. There were, there are most of those uh, players, unfortunately, uh, who played for the Yankees or the Highlanders. As soon for as only he said it, game. I immediately thought of Pete. <laughs> Pete? Oh, sorry. I, a friend of mine just told me we should let Pete know Pete's favorite player was Roy White. I thought it was on mute. So he says, we should let Pete know. We found yeah, let Pete know. Couple, have him come in. Yeah, we found him a couple of years ago. I don't know what happened to Pete. It didn't end well for Pete, but he loved Roy White. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, uh, the, the, the least among them, there were a couple of the players who are still um, more recent and, 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 um, and I did reach out and I was able to contact one of them, Stefan Weaver, who uh, lived in San Francisco. But the couple of times we tried to make phone calls or talk through Google or whatever, our, our, our schedules just didn't match up. And so I was never able to talk to him. And as I was writing the book, I made the conscious decision that I'm writing it sort of as a historian rather than as, as interviews with the players. And so I, I thought, well, if I interview some and it's written in their voice and the rest of the book's written in my voice, it doesn't really work. So so actually, I never met any or have talked to any of those guys. Thank you. When I think of Roy White, not only do I think of Pete, but the first thing I think about is the sacrifice fly. That's what he was known for. Roy White set the American League record for sacrifice flies in 1971. I think he had 17 that year. And that's still the American League record. Uh, Bobby Bonilla tied it, um, as I think, as the major league record. You could check it. I'm not sure if he did it when he was like with Baltimore or whatever, but his most of his career is in the National League. So I think it was the MLB record. It's still the American League record, and uh, it, the MLB record is is a record he shares with Bobby Bonilla. But yeah, the sacrifice fly. This thing. Also, a great fielder, never made an error. I'm sorry, Donald. That's okay. 
Um, I was going to ask you about Stephen Weaver because I, I knew Stephen Weaver um, in my brief time in Fort Lauderdale in 1980. Um, he was a, he was a very good pitcher in the Florida State League, and he made a fast run to the big leagues. He was in the big leagues, like you said, in 1982, and pitched in just one game. And unfortunately, I I just read about his passing. Mm, he just he just passed. Yeah, he was in. Um, um... I sort of liken his life to Sam Malone of Cheers. Um, you know, he had some uh, substance abuse and alcohol in his life, and then he beat it. And he had a he had a tavern or a bar of some sort in in uh, San Francisco, and that sort of reminded me of the story of of Sam Malone on Cheers. He and I, uh, he was very nice. We traded a couple emails, like, "Yeah, I'd love to talk to you." And you know, when I was working full time. As a principal, there was just I just didn't have a whole lot of time, right? And and he was running a bar, and we were on opposite coasts. I'm in New Jersey, and when he was available, I was probably not available. And when I was available, obviously it was early in the morning, much too early, and and then he wasn't available, so we could we never were able to 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 meet and touch base. But yeah, I did see that a couple of months ago, or about a month ago, I guess he passed. Yeah, he was he was a really nice guy. He really was. He was he was very smart too, very smart guy, and you know you could tell that um, that he's, he he came from a very very well educated family. He 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 read a lot of books, and he was just one of those guys that a lot of guys looked at him and they didn't know what to make of him because he was so smart. And you know, as Jim Bouton mentions in Ball Four, uh, uh, you know he it's a different era. He and uh, Bouton's you know fifteen years before that, but. Uh, you know, a lot of the guys didn't necessarily look at the college guys the same way they looked at the other guys, right? They're like, hey, you know, you you actually read books. One of the things about Roy White was Roy White was a big time reader, too. He loved to read. And uh, one of the interesting things I was able to do in the book with Roy White's permission, everything I did was with his permission, because I said, it's your book and you're going to have the final say over every word, every comma, everything. Um, obviously, over the course of the year, he came to trust me and uh, he didn't even ask for me to take anything out um, or change any of the grammar or anything like that. He said, I don't care about the grammar. I trust that you can write. And obviously I think I can. Um, but as part of writing of the book, um, after certain sections, I was able to talk to some of his teammates who he played with to talk about what it was like to be with Roy White. So one of the minor league guys he played with was a guy named Ian Dixon who I could tell you an interesting story with him if you, if you like. But then I talked about with Chris Chambliss about his days on the Yankees. I talked with Willie Randolph about his days on the Yankees. <laughs> I talked with Ray Negron, who's a Yankee executive. Um, and I talked with a guy named John Sippen, who played with Roy White in Japan. Sippen had played for the San Diego Padres for a very brief time, I think in 1969, and then was a star in Japan for about 10 years. Um, and he and Roy, Roy gave him a lot of credit for helping make the transition to learning how to play in Japan as an American. And over the years, they had lost contact. So one of the nice things, the nice stories that came out of my experience was I was able to find John Sippen and interview him for the book and then get him and Roy White back in touch again. And again, it speaks a lot to Roy White's character that John Sippen said, I wouldn't do this except for Roy White. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, talk well, to anybody. What, about him. what were, what were his stats in Japan? Did he play a lot? How did he do? He actually did great. Um, he hit a lot more home runs. He, his first year, he batted behind Sadahara O. Oh. So he and Sadahara O oh were teammates that first year in Japan in 1980. And, you know, I'm doing this all off the top of my head. So you forgive me if I'm wrong, but O oh led the league in home runs by one, I believe, over, over uh, Roy White. I think O oh, might have hit 34, 33, and Roy White at 32, I believe. We could check that on baseball reference. But um, the interesting thing is when Roy White was early on with the Yankees, they batted him fourth to protect Mickey Mantle in the batting order, even though Roy White wasn't a home run hitter. So this is a guy who batted fourth behind Mantle and Sadahara O, oh, which is just also very fascinating. Did, did Roy White talk about the fact that he was kind of put in a position where he had to be, I hate to say a slugger, um, especially in the 68, 69, 70, 71 teams where they just did not have 
a, a lineup that could um, really uh, you 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 could pitch around everybody except for guys like Mercer and 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 Roy White. And the fact also is that. But, uh, Roy was in the service for two years in 66 and 67. Well, no, he was in the military for, for a few years. So he lost a little bit of time coming up. Yes. Um, he went into the reserves. And so they had to, he had to miss time to fulfill his, his obligations uh, with, with the reserves. And he talked about how some of the other major leaguers who were in the reserves. I think like Bobby Mercer went into active duty. And so he actually missed full years, Bobby. Um, but, but Roy White was able to do it over weekends and things like that. But he said there was like talk among the ball players. Some ball players in the reserves had less vigorous commanding officers at their bases or whatever. And they're like, Oh, you're going to be away. That's cool. Don't worry about it. And some of them, Roy White said the first year in the reserves, his guy was like, if you have to be here this weekend, you have to be here this weekend. And he talked about once flying out to California, playing one game, getting on a plane, flying back to New Jersey to go, I think, to Fort Dix, uh, serving his weekend, then flying back out to California to continue the West Coast trip. They, he didn't get any um, any time off. He, as far as being a slugger, one of the nice, one of the neat things about him is in this area, at least, like he's still a big name. People see him. They if they if they they're like they they just like Roy White. I can't believe I'm finally meeting you. You were like the big part of my childhood. He was the guy who bridged those two eras, right? The only guy who played with the Mantle era and then with the Reggie era. And he was the star during with Mercer and then Munson during those very lean years from the mid '60s to the mid '70s. Um, but he's so humble and so. He would say stuff like, yeah, I was leading the league in home runs for the first couple of weeks of the season. And then I made a big mistake. I thought I was a home run hitter. And then I tried to hit home runs and I didn't. <laughs> so he he always kept himself, he, even all these years later, he keeps himself very humble and modest. And and there's a, there's a depreciating type of modesty that he has that that's really comes out. And it's really something that's that's really special to to hear him talk about himself like that. So he made the decision after he realized that he couldn't swing for the fences. And that's why he started to choke up on the bat because he did that purposely to remind himself, I'm not a home run hitter. Well, I'm glad Roy White is the way I always thought he would be. But what was the feeling when he came up with the Yankees? Up to 64, it was a given. The Yankees win every year. Then all of a sudden, they got old fast, and Bouton and Downing did not pan out. Tresh and Pepitone didn't pan out. And now... He finished last in 66. The Mets come in in 69. You know, Mano retires after 68. Like, what was the feeling there? Was it, how did they handle the fact that they were no longer the team that no matter what wins every year? When he signed with the Yankees, uh, I think it was 1962 when he was offered a contract, you know, he thought, holy cow. I'm going to be in the world series every year. This is unbelievable. And then it all fell apart. And, you know, we didn't really get into like how, what, how miserable was it? Because this was at the beginning of his career. He actually went up and down a little bit in 1967. He was actually traded to the Los Angeles Dodgers um, played for much of the year in their minor league system. And in, in, I think in Spokane, if I'm not mistaken. And um he was actually on loan, but the Dodgers really liked him. They saw him as a player that fit the Dodger mold, switch hitter, quick, speedy, good defensively, on base type of guy. Um, and the Yankees then asked for him back and they made a deal with the Dodgers to get him back because the Yankees, um, Cleet Boyer had gotten hurt and the Yankees needed Roy White because when he first came up, he actually even wasn't an outfielder. He was an infielder. He played second base as a kid. And shortstop, the Yankees put him into the outfield. Then they tried him at third base. And he talks about when he was playing third base with the Dodgers, Ron Fairley was at first base. And Ron Fairley was extremely um, athletic. And uh, I think, or, or Tommy Hutton, I'm, I'm mixing him up. Um, and everything he threw over there, the guy caught. Um, 
And then he went to the Yankees in the major leagues and tried to replace Cleet Boyer, one of the great defensive players of all time at third base. And the guy at first base was Mantle who is sort of like a statue. He didn't move very well. And so Roy White said it didn't last very long at third base because he made a ton of errors and he got booed all the time. And, and that next year, uh, Ralph Houck said, you're going to play in the outfield. We're not moving you around anymore. You're an outfielder and that's where you're going to stay. Can you tell me about his first few years in the minors in Fort Lauderdale? Was he in, in Shelby, North Carolina for a while and Greensboro? Were those some of the cities that he played in? He, um, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, he played in Greensboro in North Carolina. And the, the major thing about what he did play in Fort Lauderdale too. The first year he was going into the minor leagues, he really impressed in spring training and the Yankees gave their minor league managers an opportunity that year to do something they never did before. Or I think since, they were allowed to sort of like have a draft of sorts and, and pick the players they wanted. So his first year, he started off in double A. And it wasn't uh, a great start for him. And then the Yankees sent him back to single A down to Fort Lauderdale. And that was actually a great thing for him because that Fort Lauderdale stadium was brand new. And it was obviously the, the stadium that the Yankees also used. And so he said like the, the, the grass was better. There were no rocks on the infield. The lighting was better. And because of that, he was able to perform much better. And then he went up the, the ranks to the minor leagues uh, and, um, you know, quickly made it to the majors. Did he say anything about Johnny Keane? He did. Uh, he, he, I don't think he especially enjoyed playing a whole lot with Johnny Keane. When I asked about which were the great managers that he played with, um, the manager who he liked to play with the most was Ralph Houck. He saw Ralph Houck as a stand-up guy, um, an honest guy. He said he was uh, had a good sense of humor sometimes. And um, he was also somewhat self-depreciating, where at one, po one point they had a team meeting after a loss. And he said, you know, you guys, you didn't play well. You got to play better. You got to do better out there. Then he thought about it for a moment and he said, well, maybe I didn't manage so well either. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, he contrasts Ralph Houck in a very nice way to Billy Martin, who I don't think he was as fond of. I don't think Billy Martin treated him fairly and Billy Martin wasn't necessarily honest with him. That comes out in the book again, without him ripping him, but just like him saying like that, like I didn't feel I was being treated honestly you know, he would say like, you're going to play this series, you're going to play. And he didn't. And in that 77 world series, this is a boy from Compton, right? Uh, this, he was going home to play against the Dodgers and he really didn't get a chance to play much in that world series. Uh, Billy Martin said he would play, he would platoon with Lou Pinella, but Roy White, I think had just a few pinch hit appearances. He didn't really get to play. And he was very, very bitter about that. And when he finally got a chance to play in the 78 world series, most people thought that he might even become the MVP of that series, but Bucky Dent had a great last game and, and overshadowed him. And Bucky, of course, had hit that big home run a couple of weeks earlier against the Red Sox. And maybe that helped propel his case as well. But a lot of the sports writers said to Roy White, as that series was going on, you're the guy who's making this happen. You're the guy who's going to be the MVP. So um, he liked playing for Ralph Houck. Um, didn't necessarily like playing for Billy Martin as much. Uh, in the between, there was Bill Verdon. I think he really respected Bill Verdon. And Bill Verdon was a whole different type of manager who he played for. Bill Verdon, uh, you know, had played on the Pirates, and he was very physically fit. And he said that spring training with Bill Verdon was, like, grueling. He really worked the guys hard. And and that winter before then, he had picked up karate. And, and so he came to camp, actually one of the few guys in great shape. So as these other players were literally, you know, becoming exhausted on the baseball field and getting sick, he was actually able to perform at a high level because he was, he came to camp in shape because he had picked up karate. Did he also talk about George? Steinbrenner? He did. He did uh, nicely. Um, 
I don't think Roy White really had any problems with George Steinbrenner. He didn't feel that the contract he was offered at the end of the 1979 season was a fair contract. He didn't feel the Yankees were being honest with him necessarily. Um, They said, you know, we only at your age, we can only afford to pay a player, I think, 150,000 this year. And back then, the players weren't as open with contracts and people didn't necessarily know, what are you making? What are you making? And the Yankees had actually offered Luis Tiant more money than they offered Roy White. And he's like, what am I? Like, this is ridiculous. I've been a Yankee all these years and you told me I could only get a certain amount of money because I'm a certain age, but you give Luis Tiant more and I'm younger. (laughs) And I think that was one of the reasons that he uh, wasn't able to come to an agreement with the Yankees because he did feel they didn't handle it um, 100% above board. Roy White was in the meeting because he was uh, working in the front office for one season. Uh, He was in the meeting with George Steinbrenner and Yogi Berra when that whole schism took place, when Yogi Berra was fired as the Yankee manager. But the line in the book, as I wrote it, and as we talked about it, was, that's not my story to tell. That's how Roy White tells it. I was there. It wasn't pretty, but that's not my story to tell. So he, again, he always kept everything above board. What did he say about Yogi as a manager? He never played for Yogi as a manager. Oh, that's um, true. He wouldn't have 64. Right. So he didn't, uh, I, I know, I think everybody ex- uh, always respected Yogi. Yeah, I, I was well. I I listened on audio to Art Shamsky's book because I saw him at a book signing about the Miracle Mets, and he said Yogi was a hitting coach, and they'd say Yogi, uh, I'm not hitting the ball well, and he'd say, See it, hit it. Yeah, right. Yogi, what if, what if it's a bad pitch it, it, with two strikes, or what? If, you know, what if I can't just try? You know, I mean, he didn't offer much as a a, a hitting coach. I think David had a question. Did he ever interact at all with uh, Phil Rizzuto, who was, I think he was the announcer for all of those years. Uh, I I do remember, I kind of fell out, the Yankees fell out of favor with me when I left New York in 64 to finish college in Michigan. Um, Lost the series, of course. Then they did all those crazy trades and CBS owned them and Mike Burke was the really ruined them. And they really upset me when Mel Allen was given the heave ho. I couldn't believe that. And I don't know if Fred Barber retired or if he was given the heave ho. Did he I think he was fired too. They fired Red Barber. They're the, great, the greatest announcers ever. And they let them go. Anyway, uh, Phil Rizzuto, I, I think we placed him right about that time. Did he ever do anything with Phil? Because he was quite a character. A uh, Phil Rizzuto, yeah. you know, I think we have an affinity in our lives for those voices that are the voices of our childhood right uh and so my my favorite announcers were phil rizzuto with frank messer and bill white they were just the best that's how i came to love baseball um that being said i'm I'm a big fan of john sterling on the radio a lot of people are you know find him find his shtick to be tiring or whatever but but i love his voice and i love the way he calls a game but uh we actually never really talked about phil rizzuto uh you know, Rizzuto was in the booth. He was he was calling the games. I don't think he had a whole lot of interaction with the players. You know, Rizzuto's big thing was um, getting on the George Washington Bridge before the game was over. That was always the yeah, big I joke, you know. So. <laughs> we actually got rides home with Bill Rizzuto. We lived in Union. He lived in Hillside. And after a game, we said, Phil, Phil, we're in Hillside. Come on, jump in the car. And the game was just ending so he could get on the George Washington Bridge. And he gave us a ride and we, and he goes, so where do you guys live? And we said, well, we live in union. He goes, you huckleberries. Did he, he say that? Yeah. Up. Yeah. He dropped us <laughs> up at the hillside border. And then occasionally we'd go to his house in the morning and we'd say, can we get a ride to the game? And he'd take us to the game. And he took us for, uh, I, he'd get us seats right behind home plate. And then we'd be ready right before the game was over for him to jump right, you know, on, on the George Washington Bridge. And we'd drive in his Datsun that they gave him free. And he was just, what a guy he was. It was so That cool. is amazing. Great story. Yeah. How old were you? Um, we were about 15, 16. As a matter of fact, one time, I must have been around 17 because we drove to our house. And I think he said, I'll drive you. He may have driven my car 
and we let our and then he dropped us back off at his house and after he passed away my friend who's a Mets fan but came along for the ride wrote an article he gave me a byline too about driving home with Phil Rizzuto and it was in the New York Post a few years ago and my friend found it at the Hall of Fame they had in the reference under Phil Rizzuto there's our article and they even mentioned it. I think John Sterling he said and he taped it mentioned it on one of the games, he goes, Did you see what those kids were talking about the scooter, giving them a ride home when they were kids and whatever. I'm sorry. I, I think that's a great that. story. That is oh, fantastic. You ought, to, you ought to write it up. That's that's beautiful. Well, we did. It's in the New York Post. Yeah, yeah I guess so. Right. Oh. It's, it, but that's great. Yeah, it was really cool. He was such he was a great guy, you know, and he uh, he's just like a, a regular guy. I love did, that. Uh, did um, Roy talk about uh, Elson Howard very much? He really appreciated Elson Howard because Elson Howard was someone who also had faced that segregation in the uh, in the South, obviously, and playing on the Yankees when he first came up. Uh, came up, I think, in 1955 or so, and so he was the obviously the first uh, black Yankee. Um, and he was a trendsetter, a pay, a, or a. a road paver i can't get the right word but right he he paved the way for for the guys who followed him and yes he was held in the highest of regard by by roy white and everybody it was it was uh elston howard who was in the dugout you know that game in 1977 when billy martin pulled reggie in, in fenway park in the middle of the inning and sent uh paul blair out there i did ask roy white about that i said like was reggie taking it easy was he was he being lazy on that play and he goes there's no way he just misread it by that point he wasn't a great outfielder and he thought billy martin was just looking for an excuse to show him up and he did but i think uh you know elson howard was the guy in the dugout helping to calm that whole situation out right definitely did he uh did he say very much about his days playing with mickey mantle and what he might have been like as a teammate he loved playing with mickey mantle uh he said like when he first went into the locker room, obviously these are guys that he grew up watching on the games of the week in California and seeing in the world series, obviously all the time. And, and they welcomed him to the team. There wasn't any like, you know, you don't belong. Jim Bouton tells a story about like when his, after his first game in the book ball four, that, uh, you know, Mickey Mantle laid out towels, like a, like, um, a walkway or something, you know, like to honor him after he pitched such a great game. And Roy White says the same thing. Like uh, Mickey Mantle was a great teammate and, you know, he, he uh, loved playing with him obviously. And it was, you know, like a tremendous honor, but you know, when he played third base, Mickey wasn't the greatest first baseman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also. I don't know if you, uh, it's just an isolated case, but, uh, I think it was the last year that Mickey played. Uh, he pitched, or he pitched. He hit against Mickey, uh, Denny McLean. I'll get my picks. Mm -hmm. Denny McLean is pitching, and I think the Tigers hit a big margin of victory. And Mantle comes up, and I think Mantle was really hung over that day. And I think Denny pretty much said, where would you like it, Mick? And he fed him up a real big meatball, and uh, Mantle hit a home run. And I think everybody knew what was going on, but uh, didn't didn't change the outcome of the game or anything like that. But I don't know if that was ever discussed between you two guys or not. That that specific home run, you know, that's a I, I know that story. I think that was Mantle's last home run uh, that he ever hit. But what Roy White did talk about was there was a double header. Probably three games left in the season might have been two right at the very end of the 1968 season. There was a double header. And Mickey Mantle was the ultimate professional. And he watched as Mickey Mantle, as all the teammates did, but as he was taped up so that he could play in that double header. And he said, I, I learned a lot from that. I said, or he said, he said, I said, you know, I'm, I'm talking for him, but I said to myself, like, how can I never give a hundred percent? If here's this guy, this great player at the very end of his career, doing all of this stuff just so he can get out on the, on the field. The season's over. I mean, we we're not in it. It's over, but he's doing this because he's got this dedication to the game and this desire to be the best he can. 
And so that really inspired Roy White. And it's something that stuck with him for his whole career. And later on, as he becomes the the veteran on the team, the long serving guy, you know, he brought that type of attitude with him. Like we go out and we play hard every day and that's, that's what we're being paid to do. And that's what we will do. And he obviously learned that by watching Mickey Mantle. With Thurman Munson's passing um, late in August of 1979 or early August, 1979, um, and that was, I guess, the, the waning days of Roy White's career. Did, did he have any feeling about being with the Yankees uh, with, without Thurman around? Um, because I know that, uh, like, Catfish Hunter retired shortly thereafter. And uh, the feeling was that that team lost the, the, the thing that really kept them together, which was the captain. And did he really did he have any real feelings about, after Thurman died, about, playing with the Yankees. Roy White and Thurman Munson had their lockers right next to each other. So Roy White's the only guy who played for the Yankees for the entire decade of the 70s, right? Uh, no one else was able to do that. Thurman Munson would have been the other other guy if he hadn't passed away. Once Thurman died, the the feeling with the Yankees was that the heart went out of them. It it just you know it they were forced to play those games that weekend and then they had the funeral and then they were forced to play that night. Bobby Mercer has that great game. And uh I basically what happened really was their their heart was was just ripped out of them and and everything was sort of put into a different perspective. Chris Chambliss was also traded at the end of that year. He was part of the deal that got the Yankees uh, Rick Starone to be the new catcher. So after 79, a lot changed. Roy White goes, Chris Chambliss goes, as you say, Catfish Hunter's not on the team anymore. Uh, Mickey Rivers was traded that year, I believe. Um, Figueroa too. Yep. Figueroa. And, you know, Gossage was hurt for much of that year. He had that thing with uh, Cliff Johnson in the, in the shower so that was a real transitional year, but but once Munson died, I I the the sense is that the Yankees were just going to go through the motions. I mean, they didn't not win on purpose. They didn't lose or anything. They in fact they were they they still did okay. I think they had a winning record, but you know once something like that happens, it's hard to 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 you know you're 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 in mourning and and it's difficult to to manage the different feelings you're feeling and go out there and play great baseball at the same time. Yeah, it was hard because there weren't that many guys from, like you said, the late sixties, early seventies, still playing it with the Yankees who were players from the, that era. And now you've got a whole bunch of new players coming in. And the, um, I just, I just probably know that it was, it was probably very hard for them to concentrate on finishing that season uh, because they knew Baltimore was going to probably win it, but they knew they had to put out, they, they still had to play games and try to win games. And they did, you know, they were professionals and and they did what they could and they did their best. But, you know, sometimes when your heart's not into something, because your heart's been ripped out, it's, it's hard to, hard to be at, at that elite level. And, you know, Baltimore was a great team in that era. So were the Red Sox and 79 was just Baltimore's year. They were just terrific. So even if Thurman Munson hadn't passed, there there was questions of whether the Yankees were even going to catch them anyway. Yeah. When I was a preteen, <clears throat> the Yankees moved their uh, AAA farm team to Northwest Ohio. Columbus. And... No, Toledo. No. Toledo. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it was sixty-five. And so um, most of us and my friends, you know, we were eight, nine, ten years old, maybe. And very few of us knew really anything about the Yankees. Uh, you know, our hearts were with the Detroit Tigers, Cleveland Indians, and maybe Cincinnati. But our fathers, for the most part, uh, you know, they came up through the 1950s with all the great Yankee teams. So that um, <clears throat> was quite exciting to hear our parents' uh, stories. So when the Yankees came to uh, our town, uh, the excitement was pretty high. But they packed the ballpark with players like Roger Repos, P. 
Pete Mickelson, uh, Jake Gibbs, and I think Bobby Mercer played for a while. Uh, but one of my favorites was a guy by the name of Horace Clark, who played the infield. And uh, it was somewhat disappointing because at that time, you know, the parent club always played the AAA in an exhibition game. So we were always talking about seeing some of the great Yankees come down, but I don't think that ever happened. Oh, that's a shame. Horace Clark was um, Roy White's roommate for a couple of years, and he talks about how they would like to, they both had an affinity for jazz music, and Roy White had a portable, or was it Horace Clark? I might get the story mixed up, but one of them had a portable record player, and the other had a whole bunch of jazz records, and they'd bring them on the road and play them in their uh, hotel room yeah. after, after the games and stuff. So, yeah, he Roy White's a big fan of Horace Clark. A lot of people feel it's not fair to call that down era the Horace Clark era either. You know, like he was actually a pretty good ball player. Yeah, one of the reasons I, I liked him, I believe the group was called Jan and Dean from California in the mid 60s or so. And they had a, a, a song labeled Horace Clark, the school bus driver. Hmm. So I always thought that was pretty cool to have a song named after you. Yeah, <laughs> I, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know if that was true or not, but you know that's how kids thought. Yeah, that's great. Uh, any stories about when he he overlapped uh, with Whitey Ford a little bit, and of course Whitey Ford and Mickey Mantle kind of went together. But Whitey Ford, any any stories he shared did, with you? Didn't, about didn't that? get a whole lot of Whitey Ford stuff. I you know I think those guys were doing their thing, like Whitey Ford and Mantle, and and living their life and. Roy White wasn't necessarily welcomed or non-welcomed, but he wasn't part of that group, right? He didn't he didn't hang with the superstars. When I yeah. talk to him about things like that, like when you were on the road, did you ever see the other players and stuff? And he he would talk about players like Rod Carew and uh, Tony Oliva, and he'd say, "Yeah, when we played Minnesota, sometimes we'd hang out. Tony Oliva and Rod Carew and I would go out to have dinner and we'd talk baseball." I mean that that's. I don't think Roy White was one of these guys who was going out and, and hitting the bars and, and and doing the things that are attributed to you know, Whitey Ford and Mickey Mantle and to a different extent, Billy Martin uh, when he was the manager, because obviously they didn't, it was a different era when Billy played, Billy wasn't still around at that point. Yeah. Um, did he have an impression of uh, today's game? Uh, some of the changes, good or bad, uh, some of the number of games they have to play, lack of double headers, the DH, anything like that? I mean, he played during the DH era, so he was there, um, you know, when the DH era comes in 73. That was the whole second half of his career. And Roy White was the type of player where he played every single game. Uh, there was at least a couple of seasons where he played all 162 games. And I did a little research on one of them. I don't think he he played both ends of double headers um, and I don't think he came out of a game. And again, I'm just doing this off memory now, but until like late August, he had played every inning of every game from the start of the year, both ends of double headers until late August when he came out of a game, like maybe in the fifth or sixth inning, something like that. So he he was the type of player and his philosophy was you go out there and you play hard and when we would talk about players when he was a coach and a roving instructor, the ones he seemed to talk the most about were the ones like the guys like Don Mattingly, Mike Pagliarillo, Derek Jeter, the guys who really, Bernie Williams, were dedicated ball players and, and worked really hard. Um, he didn't ever bemoan the game today. Every now and again, because we were obviously talking during the season, he would say just like, yeah, I heard this or that or the other thing, but but nothing that I'd be at liberty to 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 share. And it was just more him saying like, well, yeah, this happened last night or or whatever, but nothing really bad. Uh, he didn't he didn't give me any. I I never got and I never asked for. I I set parameters for myself when when we did this, and I told him that I said if I ever ask you a question that you are not comfortable with, you just say I'm not going to answer that. I I totally respect that. But I also never wanted to be the guy looking for dirt or looking for the inside scoop so I could use it somewhere else. I didn't want him to ever have any reason to not trust me implicitly and, and completely. So um, 
you know, I, ne- I, I never really pushed him on stuff like that. Like, Ooh, Aaron judge doesn't have a contract. Is he angry? And things like that. Be- but because we, uh, I, 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 again, I wanted him to trust me implicitly. Uh, I only asked for his autograph once and I wasn't even going to do that, but long story short, I'll, I'll make it real quick. My sister became a Roy white fan. I told you that in the beginning because the neighbors growing up across the street, there were these twin boys. Their last name was Damiano. They were Italian. And this is 1977. The coolest guy in the world was Fonzie, if you were a kid. And these two guys, they were both Fonzie. I am telling you, they're girls and they could drive and they were good looking. And like they were, they, for me, looking up to them, they were the coolest. And looking, my sister looking up to them, they were the coolest. They probably had about seven years on us. Um, Long story short, one of them still lives across the street from the house where I grew up and my parents still live. And um, he has colon cancer. And so the one time I broke my own rule about asking for an autograph was I bought a get well card. And when I was with Roy White, when we were all done with our work, I said, I never wanted to ask you for this because I never wanted to cross this line. And, but I have a favor. And he's like, what? You want my autograph? I'm like, well, yeah, but not for me. <laughs> And then I told him the story. I say, it's his name is Lar, and, and, you know, if you could just sign the get well card. And so then he did, obviously he with, with, with graciousness and, and happiness, uh, you know, to, to be able to help somebody else out. And then I brought the card over to him, obviously, and it, you know, choked him up. And he was just amazed that uh, he would get a get well card from his baseball hero, Roy White. Wow. Great story. How is he, is he still, is he hanging in there with the disease? He's, hang, he's, hit, he's hanging in there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we Roy White has a foundation. It's called the Roy White Foundation. Um, one of the things when you're a baseball player, or whatever, it, and and you're, it's not like the Mister October Foundation or the Safe at Home Foundation, which uh, Joe Torre has, or the Turn Two Foundation that Derek Jeter has. You know, there's the level of the great Yankee foundations and then there's Roy White's foundation. And so he talks about that. So he his his foundation isn't one of these ginormous things like some of the others. But what they do is they give scholarships to needy kids as they get into college, but not a scholarship for college. They don't have that kind of financial wherewithal, but they give them seven hundred and fifty dollars to help them get a computer, their textbooks and that kind of stuff. And because of covid, the. um Roy White Foundation had a couple of big events scheduled that they had to cancel and things like that. And so I'd asked him, like, is the foundation going to come back? What are, what are you going to do? And he's like, we're trying. And so I said, let's do something. I'm an adjunct professor at, at Ramapo College in Mawa, New Jersey. And through a, a friend of mine who um, works also at the college, we were able to secure some space on campus. And we had a big event in November. Um to kick off the Roy White Foundation again, to, to raise some money so that more kids could get scholarships to go to college, which was really a neat thing. And I was hoping that my neighbor would be able to go, but he he was having chemo that week, I believe, and he just wasn't feeling well. So we are setting up big events for the, for the spring once the book comes out. And my hope is that he'll be able to get to one of them and have a chance to shake Roy White's hand and thank him and all that. Uh, who were some of his uh, roommates on the um, road? Yeah, or in minor league. Hor- Horace Clark. Um, the the other roommate when when he was in the minor leagues, they stayed in um, because it was segregated. They couldn't stay with the team, and so they had to stay in in like the black side of town. And um, those accommodations obviously weren't as as nice or as good. And the players that he talked about weren't anybody that um, was able to, you know, make the big leagues and and who who people would be able to go. Oh yeah, one guy he talked about was a pitcher who talked about how a couple of years pri- previously playing at some level he had beaned a guy and the guy actually died. Uh, that left an impression. Um, as I said earlier on the road in the early years, he roomed with uh, Horace Clark. 
I don't know. I never asked who he roomed with otherwise because he was he would just sort of tell that sort of stuff. So I have the impression that he didn't have a roommate the the second part of his career. Did but that's have, just my speculation. Did, did he ever talk about whether the Yankees were slow in 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 signing black ball players or whether that that was a problem that he felt with the Yankee organization? Early well, the time on. he went to the Yankees, that that had passed, right? Because because uh, Ellie yeah. Howard came up like in the mid fifties, and he was signed in sixty two. You least, know, and yeah, I mean, there were other black were... athletes with him. The Yankees suffered from that. You know, obviously, as historians, we we say that. But again, I didn't go there with with the with the book. Like these are the problems that the Yankees had. It's it's it was really this is Roy White's own story growing up and and then reaching the big leagues. But he didn't feel anything there. He didn't feel that the Yankees were limiting the black players or he was getting treated any different by the time he came up because it's funny you know I was just a kid then in the late 60s I was mean, a teenager but I never knew about you know the segregation part and and the prejudice it never you know, we were young and dumb back then we didn't know things so it wasn't until years later it, it kind of I, I thought about that yeah. And, and again, he's not a bitter man. I mean, he, you, 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 you could be, if you face that if people treated you differently. He talks about how he went into a restaurant once when he was in the minor leagues and it was a black waitress. And she said, I can't serve you. And he goes, well, you can work here. She goes, yeah, but I can't serve you. And he wasn't allowed to eat there. He had to leave. Um, and and you could be bitter about that, but that's not who he is as a human being. He always finds a way to, to to see the good in 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 everything and in other people which is really what what helped make the whole project something that was special um is this uh if he um lived or during his minor league career uh in areas that had the segregated hotels would that necessarily mean that the ballparks that he played in were also segregated? Yes, yes. And the the black fans had to sit out in the outfield. Yes. And they didn't necessarily stay in, or maybe on the road they stayed in hotels, but like at home, they just stayed like with other people. Yeah. You know, they stayed in people's homes and things like that, boarding houses and, and things like that. So, um, but yes. And like some of the racism he felt he heard was you know just the fans yelling mean stuff to him like when he would be announced now batting roy white and people would yell no he's not and you know like stuff like that it was just you know like constant humiliation and and put down because of the color of your skin but but he never ever displayed any anger uh for any of that I, again his, his comment was always like the other people who came before me had it much worse Really special guy. Did he mention anything about Bill Robinson, who played with him for about four years? Yeah, and Bill then... Robinson. He said uh, the. I don't think it's in the book, but basically he didn't make it because I think the pressure of trying to be great was too much for him in New York, and he didn't really get to be really good until um, he left. And then I also remember Bill Robinson. You talked about the '79 Orioles playing on the '79 Pirates, who beat them in the World Series, right? Right. Yeah, he was a highly touted player when he came up. Everybody yeah. thought Bill Robinson was going to be something special, but he tried. Uh, I think he overswang and he uh, swung, swang. But he tried too hard to hit home runs. He he over he put a lot of pressure on himself, and it uh, you know obviously impacted the beginning of his career. Definitely. Sounded a little bit like Dizzy Dean for just a minute. Swang. <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was what Dizzy Dean did, right? He always made up his words. <laughs> <laughs> Who were some uh, mentors for Roy before it was a young man, before he signed a contract with the Yankees? Who were like coaches or mentors? That yeah, is, 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 uh, so, so the story is, a lot of the guys he was growing up with were getting these really big signing bonuses, um, you know, tens of thousands. One guy got $50,000. And so as they're playing all together and they're watching all these other guys in the neighborhood getting all this money, Roy White's thinking, like, I'm going to get signed. Somebody's going to sign me and I'm going to make some good money. 
that never happened because I guess the story among the scouts was that he was going to go to college because if he didn't sign, he was going to go to college. Roy White was actually a very good student um, and, and a smart person. So one day this guy, uh, Tuffy Hanchin, who's nobody's ever heard of, shows up at his house and he mm -hmm. says, the Yankees want to sign you. I've seen you play. And Roy's like, we knew who all the scouts were. I never saw this guy, but okay. Um, and he offered him a terrible contract, something like $5,000 with maybe 2000 at, at, at as a signing. And then you'd get the rest of it each time you made it to a different level of the minor leagues and you get the rest if you made it to the major leagues, you know, tens of thousands of dollars less than, than all these other guys in the area who were getting signed. And, um, his parents by then had been divorced and his mom was not necessarily an active part of his life as part of making big decisions like that. And she didn't really know about baseball like professionally. And so the person he went to was his baseball coach. And, and he asked him, he said, uh, like, what do I do? What should I do here? Do I sign it? And uh, the coach said, isn't your dream to play big league baseball? And he said, yes. And he goes, it's with the Yankees. So you'll probably be in the World Series. I mean, what could be better than playing for the Yankees? Uh, Roy White grew up actually as a Cleveland Indian and Cincinnati Reds fan. He liked their uniforms. And uh, so even though he's in California, those were the teams he rooted for the most. But um, that was who he went to. He went to his coach to really make that decision on whether or not to sign. And then, then he, of course he did, but he signed so late. It was after all the other guys had signed. And so he didn't even go to play minor league ball that first year. They said, why don't you just stay home? You've missed part of the season already. Um, and so he was actually signed with the Yankees, but still playing like American Legion ball for a, for a year until that next winter when he uh, finally saw the contract that comes from the Yankees with the tickets to go on the airplane to fly to Florida. It was the first time he was ever on an airplane. First time he ever left uh, California. Other thoughts, questions. I'm happy. I listen. I'll stay here all night. I I love talking baseball, and it doesn't even have to be Roy White stuff. I like I liked your book. That my two favorite uh, um, chapters of your first book were the Alvaro Jimenez because we my dad took me to that game. And you were at that game. Yes, I was. Oh, that's that game, amazing. That, that was he went two for six in that game, and I remember getting a baseball card the next year, and I figured I saw his first major league a game, and I thought this is great. And then he he was gone. We never saw him again. He was a triple A player from that point on. And the other one is my dad told me more about this guy than I never saw him play, but Hal Stowe, who was a pitcher. And he just he 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 went through the Yankee farm system and he just had his one little chance. There he you, is. You named two of the guys on the cover. There's Hal Stowe. Yes. And there's uh, Elvio Jimenez. That's kind of ironic. But yes, Hal Stowe, um, what I tried to do with that book was tell the story of the player and then relate it to a different Yankee story, a different part of Yankees history. Um, and Hal Stowe was um, a guy who I, I, you know, I have to get my, my, my story straight, but he was a starting pitcher who they made into a relief pitcher, which I compared to the story of what the Yankees then did in the 80s with Dave Rigetti, a starting pitcher who they made into a relief pitcher. And if I'm remembering correctly, Hal Stowe pitched his game in 1960. Yes. And Casey Stengel really liked him. But for whatever reason, when... Ralph Houck became the manager in 1961. Ralph wasn't as high on him. And that's the reason he didn't really make the team. And that's why he became, he didn't know it at the time, at least among them Yankee. <laughs> but, but it's, it's amazing how some of these things happen. It's not just because you didn't have the talent or you got hurt or something happened along the way. It's, um, it was just a manager managerial change. And he would have probably been a big part of the 61 Yankees if Casey Stengel had still been the manager. Well, I enjoyed that book a lot as a Yankee fan. I, I've read a lot of books and that's definitely a keeper. Oh, and, wow. <laughs> and I'm Thank really you. looking forward to Roy White because uh, obviously with Roy White, that's somebody I've watched his almost his whole major league career and um, got a Roy White bat at bat day one day. Oh. One time. 
And you know, when you get a bat like that, you, you, you never forget when you, the guy hands you a bat and it's Roy White, it's not Len Bamer or it's not uh, Bobby Cox. Bobby Cox is a Hall of Famer now, but he, he didn't get there by playing third base at, at Yankee Stadium. But uh, I'm looking forward to Roy, your Roy White book a lot. And the other book, I, I recommend anybody reads that one because there's so many great Yankee, Yankee stories in that book that, um, that you don't really read in either like one of Marty Appel's books or any of the other books that I've read. Oh, thank you so much. Marty Appel actually wrote the, um, the introduction to the Roy White book. The, the interesting thing I found is like, I'm a nobody. I'm just, I was, I'm a, I was a school teacher and a school principal for a long time. And, you know, I just wanted to write and I love writing. And I, I, uh, you start writing and then you reach out to other authors and you sort of expect, or at least I expected them to be like, who are you? You're not in our club, you know, <laughs> like you're not one of the writers. And, but so many of them have just been unbelievably kind to me. And, and like when I sent the draft for the least among them out, uh, a couple of writers, Steve Steinberg, who wrote a book on Urban Shocker, um, right. he, he was just super unbelievably nice. And he sent me back revisions and corrections. So like, no, change this, change that. And I mean, and, and not just like factual corrections. There was one, I won't tell you who it is. There was one writer um, who was not nice. Uh, I had an error in my introduction. Um, and he wrote me back, like, I'm not reading this. You can't even get the introduction right. Like, yikes. And I, like, that was in the very beginning of me sending things out. And I was sort of like, uh-oh, I just ruined my career as a writer. But everybody else, except for the one person who I'll never mention, uh, ha have just been gracious and kind and helpful. Chris Donnelly, uh, who's written a couple of Yankee books, um, another mm -hmm. New Jersey guy. he's He actually did a number of revisions for me. Um, he was actually a student at Pompton Lakes High School when I was the vice principal there. So, <laughs> so he was especially nice to me. But, you know, I went my way in my career as a principal and he went his career and we hadn't talked for 25 years or whatever. And and to be honest, he's a great he was a great student and a great kid. And I was the vice principal of the high school and I dealt with the kids who were in trouble. So I didn't have a whole lot of interaction with him, except that everybody knew who he was because he was a great kid. Um but yeah, he helped out along the way. Uh, Don Burke, who used to write for the New York Post and the Bergen Record, um, he helped with a bunch of revisions. It's just amazing, like like how nice and kind and helpful these these people are as, along the way to to help other people um, live out their dreams. Don't go anywhere. Though. I want to show you something real fast. I'll be right back. Okay. <clears throat> You were talking about bat day bats, right? So yep. here's here's my bat day bat. When I went, this is probably like 80, 83 or 84. You didn't get a player's name on it. It was just the Yankee bat day bat. But people were amazed that they would give real bats out, right? But when yes. I went to Yankees Fan Fest, I carried this with me the entire day and went up to Greg Nettles. It's backwards, I guess, on there. I'm not oh. sure, but... <laughs> Yeah. Greg Nettle signed it for me. So it sits on my shelf. And I asked him, could you write number nine on the handle as if it were in the uh <laughs> oh. as if we're in the thing? So he Greg Nettles did that for me. So nice. I know how special a bat day bat is. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah, when you get the guy to really sign it, you're right. <laughs> so. I have a couple of bats from Bat Day at the old Cleveland Municipal Stadium. Oh, fantastic. And they were red red bats and i have a car still have a carlos bag or uh bat you know it's not a personalized autograph but it's the kind that you could buy at a, at any athletic store and i believe it's a 32 ounce uh pardon me 32 length 32 inches amazing right that i don't think they give yeah. bats out like that anymore no no they give the little ones you know the, like the big toothpick mm. <laughs> We, we lose a lot of society as we make these changes because there's something special about the bat day bat. Like, well, I, I guess... can't wait until they give out uh, um, a digital bat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if you guys, but I, I, I don't understand it, but there is a portion of the baseball card collecting industry where people are just getting digital cards, right? Like, 
I don't I don't quite get it because if your computer crashes or something, do you lose your digital card? I mean, to me, I like having a real card <laughs> you can hold in your hand. Definitely. All right. Uh, I went to a, <clears throat> uh, a breakfast today and uh, uh, a guy brought in a, a Ron Guidry card. And so he asked the question, where did Ron Guidry pitch his last professional game? Oh, wow. Uh, where did Ron Guidry pitch his last professional game? That's a great question. I think his last year was like 88 or 89. And he played his whole career with the Yankees. So I, the, I'm, I'm assuming that he pitched in the minor league somewhere along the line. Ooh, as, very as, good. Very as a good. coach, something like that. So very what's the good. answer? I don't know. He pitched his last game for the Toledo Mud Hens. Mm. And I apparently, according to my friend, he um, he was bombed. Oh, so he uh, he gave up the game and and left that day. But the key to that question is, is his last professional game, not his last major league game. Mm. So you oh, got to be right. careful. He's he was trying to hang on. I think David just showed us. Is that an uh, original fifty three mantle? I'd love to say that it is, and I had one. But alas, I sold it for hardly anything about 1977 or 78. And uh, oh, probably about 20, maybe 20, 15 or 20 years ago, I was able to get a complete replication of the 1953 top set. Oh. So I do that. I do that. So, you know, oh, look what I've got. But I, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a copy. That's it's still copy. pretty neat. So I do that to see if anybody. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you, have you in turn had people now approach you to take a look at drafts of some of their work. Yes. Um, um, there's a, Kevin Baker just wrote a book. I think it just came out um, and it's called the next Mickey Mantle. So hmm. I looked at, I looked at his book and what I've done with anybody who's helped me, I've always said back to them, I'd love to help you along the way with, with your books. Another guy, Rob Skeed, who writes a lot of children's books um, and uh, is is uh, a number of baseball books, a couple of picture books. He wrote a book about Satchel Paige. He um, has a book coming out at the end of this year about Johnny Vandermeer. He was, uh, and is a friend of mine, uh, living in the same town as I do. He was very helpful with me as as I started in my career, helping me with ideas on on writing and, and how to get published and all that kind of stuff. So... It's 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 amazing how there are people out there that are only too willing to help. But yes, I am always willing to help, and I offer that to any to anybody because, you know, I I, I believe that that's what life's all about. I, when I was a principal, I would tell the kids all the time, like if you give love, it comes back to you, and it comes back to you in greater amounts than you ever gave. And if you give kindness, it's the same thing. And kindness and love, when we give it away, it comes back to us in greater amounts than we ever gave. So yes, I'm always happy to, um, to do stuff. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Although he didn't write about the New York Yankees, uh, David Fleiss is having a, a book called about Ernie Lombardi, the big schnoz yeah, coming right. out in April. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the book that you just mentioned, uh, The Next Mickey Mantle, is that a book maybe about players who were going to be the next Mickey Mantle and maybe never were? Yes, I could I could go grab a copy if you give me 30 seconds. I'll just run over and grab it. I can show you what it looks like. But yeah, that's that's what it's all about. Steve Whitaker, Bryce Harper. Um, hey, Kirk Gibson. Uh, um, Bobby Harvey Mercer's Sparks. in there. Uh it's, it's it's really the story of each of the guys who are going to be the next Mickey Mantle. I think Mike Trout's in there, um, most of whom who didn't make it, obviously. And it's really a fascinating book because it talks about all these guys that were going to become the next great Yankee or the next great player, and they weren't. So some it's actually, like, Mike Trout East is, and, and Bryce Harper could be, but but most of them didn't make it. Yeah, that's what his book's it's about. A kid out of Southeast Michigan, Brighton, Michigan, named uh, Drew Henson, and he did play for the Yankees. Couldn't hit a curveball, I understand, and actually played quarterback for the University of Michigan. I think he had a little bit of a cup of coffee with the Dallas Cowboys, but he was like just so far advanced in high school, and he just never, never panned out. 
in a professional career. Mm. Okay. He should be in the book if he isn't. He is. He's in the book because I have a. Okay. I, well, he played more than one game, but I have a chapter in there about yeah, two is. sport Yankees guys who played oh, okay. uh, for two different sports, um, oh. and 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 he gets a mention in there because of that. Oh, okay. Oh. Were you going to get something to show us? I, I could go get that next Mickey Mantle book if you give me. It'll take me ten seconds. Sure. I don't. You want to wait? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. I'll go get it. Be right back. Well, in case our neighbors come over and my wife calls me in and I'm not here at the end, nice going, Sam. Great meeting. Thank and you. Uh, we really appreciate what you do. It'd be nice maybe to get together live and in person, but I guess you can't beat Zoom. No, no it makes it more convenient for everybody, but we have some things in the works that we may be getting together in the future. So. Oh, I said I said the wrong uh, person, Barry Sparks. Mm -hmm. okay. And the book is called The Search for the Next Mickey Mantle. Oh, that's going to be. OK, so he talks about Tom Tresh, Joe Pepitone, Roger Repose, Bobby Mercer, Steve Whitaker, Bill Robinson, Tony Salida, uh, Ron Blomberg or Bloomberg, Clint Hurdle, Kirk Gibson. I thought you were going to mention Kirk Gibson when you said Michigan before. Jay Buhner, Greg Jeffries, Ruben Rivera, Mike Trout, and Bryce Harper. Hmm. So it's great. Uh, Highly Anderson, recommended. Sparky Anderson, when he first saw Kirk Gibson, put that tag on him. Oh, he's And he was incredibly gifted athletically. And he was a great player, but, uh, but not quite the same as Mickey Mantle. But uh, I think he lived under that cloud maybe of his whole career he never seemed to live up to what people expected of him i i, now, I worry when people do that and they they put that tag on people and say you're going to be the next joe tori lovello was uh, going to be the next joe dimaggio because he was italian yeah. and uh he was actually played in our hometown for a brief period he played in class d in auburn new york when they were affiliated with the yankees probably in 58 or 59 and a very short period of time that he was there. I, I think I was in a bar where he was. I can't be sure of that. You know, I'm too old to remember clearly anymore. But anyway, uh, he too never quite lived up to the Joe DiMaggio persona that was placed on him as a kid. But I remember all those Yankees, and it was just kind of a given. You went, everybody overlapped. Ruth, Gehrig, DiMaggio, Mantle. Someone must, has no. to be next and overlap with man on all those guys were going to be the guy and none of those guys were the guy unbelievable i i wrote a piece the the ibwaa is is a neat organization it's called the independent baseball writers association of america and it's been around for a, a, probably a, a little of a long time it's uh Anybody who writes about baseball or who is a big fan, you could you could join it. But basically, it's people who write about baseball who aren't in the Baseball Writers Association of America because, you know, they're very exclusive. And they have a monthly, a weekly, a, a daily newspaper that we sign up for on a monthly basis. It's called uh, Here In The Swing or Here's The Pitch. And um, I just wrote a piece about the for last month about. When Mickey Mantle, excuse me, when Bobby Mercer was traded for Bobby Bonds, and I sort of made a connection there that Bobby Mercer, in many ways, was supposed to be the next Mickey Mantle, yeah. and Bobby Bonds, in many ways, was supposed to be the next Willie Mays, and how they were traded for each other it was the closest thing, maybe, to like Mantle for Mays or DiMaggio for Williams. Neither one of them quite became what they should have been but at the time of that trade they were big time players like both had been multiple time all-stars at the top of their game and really they got that trade and they never really achieved that level of greatness ever again That's interesting. Oh. i just want to say i have two roy white thrills that i had two games that i went to where he he was the hero in september of 68 when the yankees were desperately hanging on to the end of the season. Roy White got the only hit of Ray Culp that day and was the only Yankee hit. And so they saved the Yankees from an embarrassing no-hitter. 
uh, get, uh, at the stadium. It was a Saturday afternoon. It was a fan appreciation day. And they had a home run hitting contest that day and all sorts of things. And But the, for me, Roy White's hit, keeping it, the Yankees out of the no hit column was, was great. And the other one, of course, unfortunately, Bill Campbell died recently, but he gave up a home run to Roy White and which my friends and I went to on a Friday, Friday night uh, where he hit it and won the game. Uh, and Bill White just went nuts. And I remember I had my transistor radio and Bill White just, you know, yelled home run, Bill Roy White. And it was just incredible. That's that's awesome. You know, I've, I was at an event a couple of months ago and uh, some people were saying, like, what are you doing in retirement? And I said, well, you know, I've been working with Roy White. I'm writing his book on these. Uh, the person's oh, Roy White. Yeah. With the Yankees. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, ah, oh, I loved the way he announced Phil Rizzuto. He was the best. <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> I told Roy White about that. He's like, yeah, I get mixed up for Bill White a lot. <laughs> oh, good stuff. You're a Met fan, correct? Uh, I had a little, it's a little bit. I'm a Met topic. fan? Did, or, uh, yeah, didn't you say that? No, oh, no, that's... Steven said he's a Mets fan. Steven did. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, I'm diehard Yankees. I don't I hate the Mets. Second, but... I have a 30 second story that you might like. Uh, I was at a garage sale about six or seven years ago in Traverse City, Michigan, and I had a softball shirt on it. And I was browsing through, and this older gentleman he mentioned, Oh, do you, do you play ball? And we chatted for, I don't know, about 10 or 15 minutes. And he says, Well, you know, he says, I'm the answer to a trivia question. I said, Really? What's that? He says, well, my name is Jay Hook, and I am the, was the winner of the very first game that the New York Yankees pitcher. He was the winner of the very first game the Mets won. They started out 0-9, broke the streak, and Jay Hook was the pitcher of record, the winning pitcher. So, And he was running the garage sale? So you're overwhelmed. <laughs> That's a great story. I love it. Yeah, it was kind of funny. You know, you're at a garage sale. How in the world would you ever expect something like that to happen? So it was fun. That is, that's, that's phenomenal. Uh, Paul. Yeah. Uh, it looks like our zoom saber time is about to run out. We got three minutes to go, I guess. Unfortunately, I wish we had longer. So it's been a great, uh, great evening. Very, uh, we so much appreciate you coming and addressing the group and thank you for the saber members and non-members that also came. We appreciate their support. Thank you, Steve. And, David and Don and Tom and Dixie, uh, thank you. And uh, anything else you want to close the evening with, Paul? Or how do we uh, find your books? Oh, you could just go on. on I'm on Amazon. It's it's they're everywhere. You go to a local bookseller, they'll get them. Uh, and uh, yeah, so at least among them, I'll make a quick pitch. If you haven't read my novel. And uh, it, it's a story, there's a lot of baseball in it. It's called Scattering the Ashes. It's a story about a young man whose father leaves a crazy request for him before he can get his inheritance. He has to scatter his father's ashes in all sorts of places. But his, he's a Yankees fan. His father's a Red Sox fan. It's, it's not autobiographical, but there's some autobiographical things in there. But they, you know, they travel to Cooper's, or he travels to Cooperstown, has to leave some ashes around Ted Williams and stuff like that. So... People who've read it, they say they say it really gets them in the heart. So it's it's all fiction, but it's a it's a great book. But listen, I don't again. I'm not here to sell books. I'm here to talk baseball, and I appreciate that you had me. I appreciate that we could have this time together. I love talking about Bat Day and Roy White and the Yankees and Jay Hook. I mean, this is a great story. This is this is what baseball is all about. This is why we do it. So I, I'd love to come back someday if you ever want just to talk baseball. I, I appreciate that you made all this time for me. I'm humbled. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Paul. And uh, we'll let everybody know when our next meeting is coming up, probably looking like March right now. You're Thank in you Miami. so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Paul. Really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Bye, everybody. That was... mm -hmm. Have a great night. Thank you. You too. Thank you.